for Kuma Media's policy, I'm Tabi Madiba, Africa editor of the organized crime and corruption reporting project, Boriga Trump, joins me to discuss their co-authored book titled, Honey, A Life Too Short. So in the updated version of Chris Honey's biography, you re-evaluate his legacy and traces his life from his childhood to the crisis in the ANC camps in the 1980s. So can you tell us more what you discovered where Chris Honey grew up and his early life? Okay, so Chris Honey grew up in what was then known as Transkei. So it's in the area of, of Mbaba, um, the village, it's not a village, I say, I mean, it's, it's you know, your typical Transkei, you've got these rondavals dotted around the landscape. So it's a very rural upbringing in a place called Sabalele. And um, there you find that people are very closely knit communities. So they all know each other, they all care for each other. Um, um, even in the times that we've gone back and forth to these places, we find that, that um, everything is celebrated together, people are commemorated together, um, and they are remembered together. So that, that was very important. And um, I'll give you, you know, the, the depth of, of knowledge and, and wisdom in this place continued to, and, and maybe I was, I was um, a bit too aloof in my approach, and, and you know, you, you can kind of be lulled into a sense of like simplicity, but never confuse simplicity with um, people having wisdom or depth of knowledge. You know, people are not foolish. Um, and, and that, I was astounded, I'll give you an example for instance. Um, one day we're driving back from um, Sabalele to Queenstown, which is the closest um, town and also the closest petrol station. We were running out of petrol. So um, I needed petrol along the way, so we asked people along the way. Um, and they point us to a place where there's essentially a shabin in the middle of nowhere. We go into the shabin and um, I mean, you stand out like a sore thumb if you're not from there. So I walk into the shabin, it's dimly lit, it's got a pool table, all of that. And um, I ask, you know, can I buy some petrol? And this guy looks at me suspiciously and he asks me, are you police? And I said, no, I'm not. He says, oh, what are you doing here? He's interrogating me. And I say, look, I'm working on a biography of Chris Hani. He tells me, what do you know about Hani? And I smirk, and again, you know, arrogant I am. I say, well, I think I know a bit by now. And he says, hmm. He laughs at me. I turn around, massive poster of Chris Hani on the wall. <laughs> and I realize, fool. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so I learned a lot. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible place where he grew up. But you can't romanticize it also because life is harsh, um, as it is today for people living in rural South Africa. And since researching this biography for the past 15 years, do you have any insights into how Chris Hani could have fitted into current day South African politics? And do you think he could have remained a loyal ANC cadre trying to reform the party from the inside? Or do you think he would have started something new? I, I think um, to answer this question, I think it's always difficult to try and imagine people in a different space. Very few people who were there in 1991 or there in 1994, people who were part of the ANC then or the SACP then, they probably didn't see who they would be um, so many years later, you know. Um, and in fact, I, I suppose many of them would be embarrassed by what they see today. But we, well, what I think is important to remember is that Chris Hani did not locate himself squarely within the ANC. First of all, he was a Secretary General of the SACP. And when it came around to a new dispensation in 1994, he's not one who was jostling for position to say like, hey, I want to be Minister of this, that and the other. Even though he was well positioned to one day be President of the country, what he did was he extricated himself. He said, no, there's a need for some of us to stand back, to actually be there in the streets, um, and, and, and be with the people to understand the need of the people and also to, to act as um, guardians to make sure that the party and the, and the movement does not lose its way. So we must not look at him squarely within the paradigm of the ANC because before he was an ANC member, he was SACP, yeah, to be clear. And which was, of course, the SACP at the time was seen as the intellectual heart of the revolutionary movement. Um, just about everybody at some point was a member of the SACP. Thabo Mbeki, Jacobs, they all resigned um, before our democratic election because of the Roy Khafar. <laughs> and why do you say that the names of Chris Hani and that of Winnie Matigizela Mandela will forever be remembered as heroes of the revolutionary and the war against apartheid? 
to what makes them stand out in particular from so many other great, great legacies is that they were not afraid to step outside of the, the safety of the group to criticize, to offer that self-criticism which is so critical within the ANC and within the SCCP and the larger political um, paradigm. So I think it's, it's important to remember that, that these people were, they always stay true to their values and, and they would make the ultimate sacrifice again and again in order to ensure that, that those values were fulfilled. And that is why they stand head and shoulders above so many others. Tell us about Chris Honey's vision of using the post-apartheid military for social change. And do you think this did not happen? No, it didn't. I, I think his idea of, of the military, I mean, look, it was, there was an idea of mobilizing civic action. We had street committees and the like. Um, and similarly with the, with the military, you know, there was an idea that it would change. And, and also, thankfully, during our transition or so, they remained um, politically, aside from, um, you know, some crazy people who ran off to, um, to homelands to try and, and subjugate black people. For the most part, we found the military state out of politics, and this continued within a post-apartheid South Africa. So Chris Hani's role in that um, would have been, I, I think it would be more towards, there's an ambition always you know, towards being people-driven, towards being delivery-driven. We're not seeing enough examples of that within these kind of forces, which were seen as, you know, like size 11, Pura coming to step on your head kind of stuff. You know, that was the image we had always of these guys. Um, so so that, has, has, um, that has changed, yes. But we do not, I don't think we wholly have, have seen a whole-scale transformation towards one of, of whole-scale service. Although you, there have been real attempts and we have seen real changes, we cannot negate that. And the SACP has been very critical of EFF's demagoguery and racially divisive populism. So do you think that Chris Honey might have related to the EFF and Julius Malema if he was still with us today? Absolutely. I think so. Um, I, I think that the EFF, um, the, the popularity of the EFF, uh, it speaks to a, a, a frustration among a large swathe of black South Africans in particular and white sympathizers because we cannot deny race in our country and it's always part of every single conversation you have. So yes, he could identify with many of those things but then at the same time they, the, the EFF also takes popular stands. They understand that because they play politics. Chris Hani was maybe less of a politician in that sense. So maybe he would, there are certain things, I don't say that he would wholesale jump in and say, ah, I'm putting on a red beret tomorrow. I don't believe that. Um, but at the same time, unless it was a SACP uh, beret, you know, but um, I think that, that he would be able to identify with, with, with some of, of what the EFF stands for. Yes, indeed. And after spending 28 years in prison for murdering Chris Hani, Yonish Valush was released on parole in December last year following an order from the Constitutional Court. So how do you think South Africans should think about the release and was it part of the rule of the law or should it never happen? It's the rule of law. We cannot deny this, you know. Um, this is the thing, you know, the conundrum which you find yourself in. When you aspire to greater humanitarianism, to be better people, um, which is what our constitution does, better than almost any other constitution. It means that you must let go of parts of your heart. Chris Hani, for so many of us, is a part of our heart. And we must suffer that because we are trying to be better people. And I mean, you, you see this time and time again, where South Africans, yes, we might not be happy um, about the rule of law, about um, what the constitution says we should accept. Um, so, so I think South Africans should be, with a heavy heart, has to let, uh, uh, we, we, ha we have to let that run its course and, and understand the release but it doesn't mean we necessarily have to forgive. Forgiveness is something which we must and that will release us of course. Mm -hmm. You know we have to allow ourselves to forgive. I don't think I have forgiven personally Janusz Walusz for his actions but I think for us to be able to move on as people, as a people, we need to be able to, to forgive. So yes, it was the rule of law and I think it's right to have conflicting emotions about this. We can be angry, we can be sad, we can bang against the wall and the like, but at the same time we must respect the constitution because it's for everybody and sometimes it's for people who you don't necessarily like. And lastly, Beauregard, do you think that Chris Honey is honoured enough or do you think he should be celebrated at the same level as Nelson Mandela or, or Artambo? 
I don't think Krasani wants to be honoured in, in, in these kind of ways where we have like a national day, a honey day for instance and the like. I think that yes, he is honoured enough. We have Krasani districts, we have Krasani municipalities. His name gets invoked at the drop of a hat, you know. Um, and sometimes I'm sure he's probably, would probably be saying, why, you know, why are you using my name to justify certain things, you know. So um, I think it's good for, more importantly, Krasani was about the collective. He didn't want to stand out as an individual and say, look at me. Um, when, it, when we needed leaders, he said, yes, I will lead because no one else was doing it. He didn't do it because he wanted to be that guy. So um, when it comes to Krasani, I think that um, as with so many of the people who have forged a way for us, we need to get familiar with their histories, with their stories, and take lessons from that. We need to know our story. It is our collective story as a people, as South Africans. So Chris Hani would, would want that, I think. Not so much, um, you know, there's a thing that the SCP is, does, which is a be like Chris, you know. Um, it can kind of cross that parallel and get over to the focus on the individual. Again, not the way for, for the, the, that Chris Hani essentially was calling for evoked. Um, I think he would want us to, to be, um, like him in many ways, but find our own way. So yeah, Mandela, Tambo, Sisulu, yes, we must remember these people, but there are so many others whose names we don't know that we must go and research and we have to go and find those stories and find the inspiration, whatever it is. Maybe it's not Hani, maybe it's not a name we all know. That was Beauregard Trump speaking to Krima Media's Polity about Hani, a life too short.